Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rez Manny, I'm an application scientist for Allied Scientific School. And today's uh, topic uh, for the webinar is laser cleaning method and case studies. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, to uh, please uh, mute your uh, microphones. Uh, if you have any questions in the middle, you could stop me, it's no problem. But in the meantime, if you could mute your microphones, and uh, this webinar is also being recorded. Uh, so uh, a copy of the recording will be sent to you. My email address is also uh, here at the bottom. If you have any questions, you can send me later. And we also have a Q&A session at the end. So we can talk about uh, your questions at the end as well. Uh, this has uh, uh, been, been many times that I've given this webinar and every time I try to make modifications and add some uh, new stuff to it. Uh, so it's a work in progress. Uh, if you have any suggestions of how to improve it, uh, you would like to see some other topics added, uh, please let me know. My email is right there. So what are the uh, topics that we are going to talk about? This is the outline of the talk. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, laser ablation which is a more general term than laser cleaning. So laser cleaning is a subset of laser ablation. The laser ablation uh, could have many different applications such as cutting, uh, scribing, uh, drilling, cleaning. Uh, so cleaning is only a subset of laser ablation. Then we will see what type of laser lasers are used in laser ablation. Uh, then we will talk about laser cleaning. I'll show you a few videos of our laser cleaning system. Uh, and we would compare this laser cleaning system with other competing surface cleaning techniques such as sandblasting uh, or uh, dry ice cleaning or water jetting. Uh, and then we will go into the physics of laser cleaning. Uh, we will talk about the dependence of laser ablation on material properties and laser parameters. So this way we'll find out how to choose the proper laser for cleaning a, a particular material. Uh, then there are several different time regimes, femtosecond, picosecond, and nanosecond. We'll talk about those. And there are also different types of scanners, servo and polygon scanners. Uh, we'll also... Uh, uh, look at those and finally we'll get into some applications of laser cleaning which our company has done in different uh, uh, environments first of all was the permafix nuclear decontamination facility in Richmond Washington there are some videos that will show there and testing at Canada Aviation Museum in Ottawa uh, removal of leaded paint which was done at the headquarters of the company and uh, some videos of the polygon scanner used in paint removal from a metal surface, and also laser paint removal from inside a pipe. So this is basically the outline of the webinar. Uh, I've also done some uh, literature uh, research, literature survey. I've added a few results there as well. So it just gives it a broader prospect. So what is the principle of laser ablation, which is the more general term, it is a process through which a high power laser is focused on a surface and removes material from it. Uh, so this could be used in several different applications, laser cutting, machining, paint and contaminant removal, rust removal, drilling, scribing. And in this uh, laser ablation, you could use both CW lasers and pulse lasers but for the purposes of this webinar, we focus on pulse lasers more because there are more parameters to adjust, uh, such as the repetition rate, the pulse width, and so on. The CW laser are pretty much fixed by their wavelength and, and their, their uh, average power. So uh, uh, we would focus more on the pulse lasers. Here's a picture that shows a pulse laser blasting uh, uh, a coating from a surface. 
So here's a quick YouTube video uh, showing a laser ablation. Let's look at this uh, quick YouTube video. So you see there is this surface and the laser beam illuminates the surface, is focused and blasts all the material from the surface. So this is like a demonstration of how laser ablation uh, basically ejects particles from the surface. So uh, moving on, uh, talking about the principles of laser ablation, uh, what is the principle? Uh, the principle is when the laser beam irradiates the surface uh, at lower powers, it could either evaporate uh, material or at higher powers, it could generate a plasma, which uh, basically makes a, a shock wave inside the material and blasts the coating off the material. So that's how it, it, it basically removes the coatings and rusts and things like that from a surface. Uh, so this, uh, when you particularly use laser ablation for removing thin coatings and rusts uh, and contamination from a surface, we call that laser cleaning. Uh, there's also an interesting principle called laser-induced breakdown of spectroscopy or LIPS, uh, is that you can also look at the emission of the plasma when you are irradiating a surface with the laser to clean it. Uh, you can look at the emission and then see what kind of emission lines do you, do you observe with the spectrometer. If uh, you're concerned that you may damage the uh, substrate, you could, uh, and say your substrate is aluminum, uh, you can also look for aluminum emission lines. And once you see that, then you can stop your laser operation or move the beam to another point. We have actually tested this in Allied Scientific Pro, the LIPS, so laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, and uh, we are in the process of adding this, this feature to, to our laser cleaners. Uh, now, another thing, the depth over which the surface is ablated, it depends on the material properties and also on the laser properties. So you need to know for which particular material, uh, which laser to use and what parameters to use. Because otherwise you may actually damage the surface if you don't choose the right parameters. And here's a definition. The total amount of material ablated from a surface per pulse is called ablation rate. So uh, more material is removed per pulse, the ablation rate is high. If less material is removed, the ablation rate is low. Now let's uh, look at the several types of lasers uh, of different wavelengths regimes that are used for laser ablation and also laser cleaning. Let's get familiar with some of these. Uh, so starting from the far left, you have the excimer laser, which is a UV uh, laser as a low rep rate laser. And uh, basically these lasers have, uh, uh, they are quite expensive and they have very low rep rates. And uh, normally because the, the, the wavelength is in UV region, they're used for photolithography uh, and uh, processes that require high resolution, like microfabrication to pattern parts of a tin film or the bulk of a substrate. Uh, also for processes that require photo dissociation of certain molecules, let's say in some uh, nuclear power plants, you want to photo dissociate. You don't want to only thermally ablate, but want to photo dissociate, you would use this type of laser. Uh, then we move on to the CO2 laser, which is in, uh, oh, I forgot to mention that the excimer laser comes in several different discrete wavelengths, say from uh, 120, between 126 to 351. So you have 193, 282, 351. And uh, so uh, their pulse width nearly about 10 nanosecond and they have the gas discharge uh, pumping method. Uh, CO2 lasers in the mid-infrared wavelengths of 10.6 micron are also very popular uh, for ablation and cleaning. In fact, for laser cutting, 
CO2 lasers have been used for many years uh, for cleaning, also I'll describe, they have a lot of applications. Uh, so these lasers are gaseous lasers, uh, they're pulsed with about 100 nanosecond and they require cooling. Their pumping method is gas discharge. Uh, you can use it both in CW and, and pulse, but there are a lot of CW CO2 lasers that are available. Uh, next one is the very popular laser, Nudumium YAG laser, near infrared at 1.06 micron. Uh, you can also put a doubly, uh, uh, double crystal there and you know get the double uh, of the uh, frequency or half the wavelength at 532 uh, nanometers. Uh, so also also the third, the 355 nanometer, you can also get that. So these lasers are solid state lasers. So, um, and their pumping mechanism is laser diode pulse width, uh, typically about 10 nanosecond. And they come in different uh, rep rates. Uh, and finally, we get the Thai Sapphire laser. Uh, this is a tunable near IR laser. And you could uh, basically tune it from, sorry, uh, 650 to 1100 nanometer, but the downside is they have to be pumped by an argon laser, which is quite expensive. And uh, therefore, uh, usually in semiconductor research and for certain specific applications of cleaning, you could use these uh, Thai sapphire laser. But I would say the most popular laser in this group would be the YAG, Neodymium YAG laser or CO2 laser. And finally, there's one more that we didn't mention in this group, and that is the fiber laser. And fiber laser is turning out to be uh, very popular in the industry right now, and it's, it's catching up. Uh, so what's the difference between the fiber laser and uh, the other lasers that I mentioned? The other lasers, they had either solid state pumping mechanism or they were they were solid state in nature or gaseous in nature so the medium of lasing was either a crystal or a gas but in case of fiber laser the medium of pumping is a piece of optical fiber and uh, instead of the mirrors that are used in lasers they have this thing called the, the fiber brack grating so this uh, there's something inscribed inside the core of the fiber and that would select only one wavelength so and reflect that particular wavelength so this way the the light goes back and forth between the the two uh, sides of the fiber and uh, it gets amplified uh, this gives a lot of flexibility in where you want to direct the beam so it's very good in that sense the laser medium depends on the doping materials such as ytterbium, erbium, and tulium. Uh, so you can also pump this with the diode laser uh, and the great uh, other advantages that they have would be high pulse energy, high average power, good beam quality, and variable pulse length. So these are uh, uh, some of the lasers that are used uh, for ablation and for cleaning. So now we get more specific and during the webinar, I go back and forth between ablation and cleaning, but let's focus right now on the cleaning part. Uh, so what is laser cleaning? Is the use of high power pulse lasers, or it could be CW also, to remove material from a surface, it helps clean the surface. So this could be to use it for removing rust or a particular coating when you need to repaint the surface uh, or oil or grease or things like that you need so you'd use a laser cleaner absorption of laser radiation causes rapid heating of the surface contaminants uh, generates a shock wave and vaporizes the contaminants uh, so uh, some examples are cleaning historical structures which have layers of nitrate and sulfate our paint removal in aviation industry. Uh, so if you use a near IR laser, the effect that you'll be using would be photothermal. So just evaporations and, 
uh, basically plasma uh, generation, shock waves. And if you use a UV laser, such as the one that I mentioned, the Exmer laser, there will be photochemical effects, which dissociate molecules. Here on the top, uh, on the bottom right, we have a, a picture of our laser system. So the box is the uh, basically the laser engine, and there's this fiber optic, uh, you can say cable that comes out. Uh, and here's a, this uh, a cubic thing here is a isolator. It doesn't allow the reflection to go back uh, into the system. And there's a lens, there's a scanner, there's a lens, and uh, the high power beam, something like 100 watt or more, 200, 500 watt, we have up to 500 watt units could come out and clean the system. So let's look at the video of it, where you see a rust being cleaned from a pipe. So we get a better understanding of how it works. So here you see the, the near infrared laser uh, is shining on this rusty pipe. And this is the, the plasma that is glowing there. Uh, as I said, you could look at this plasma and then you could see what kind of elements are showing there. And this pipe is basically the suction pump, which, is, which absorbs all the uh, uh, ablated material and keeps the environment clean. So you can see that the rust is being cleaned very nicely on the surface of this pipe. Okay, so let's move on. Next is important parameters for laser cleaning. So one has to decide when you're using a pulse laser, what, uh, how to adjust the parameters so it'll be most suitable for the surface. So what are these parameters? Number one is wavelength. Uh, so some wavelengths are heavily absorbed by the, some material and some others are reflected. Uh, as an example, you can see near IR is heavily absorbed by metals, but uh, it is uh, basically far IR, metals reflect far IR, they don't absorb far IR. But polymers absorb mid IR better than near IR. So if you have a coating, uh, some kind of coating, which is a polymer on a metal surface, uh, so you have to be aware of the fact that the, the underneath substrate would absorb heavily uh, that radiation if you use near IR. And um, basically, you could potentially damage. The, the substrate if you don't uh, take care of the parameters. But if you use a CO2 laser, far IR, the substrate doesn't absorb that much. So uh, in that way, it's safer. Although there are some other advantages for near IR, which I'll describe later. It's all a trade-off. Uh, then you have the pulse width and it actually we will get into the physics of that later, but it turns out the depth of ablation may depend on the pulse width. So how far uh, you basically go deep into the material. Longer pulse width will have more penetration depth and require higher energy per unit area to ablate the material. So if you use a longer pulse width, the, the heat will go deeper into the material and so if you need to remove that material, you need uh, higher energy. So that's why you have uh, basically bigger threshold. Then you have pulse energy. Uh, if you increase the pulse energy, the ablation rate will increase. The beam shape plays a role. Uh, so for machining, for example, again, we're going back to ablation. It must be small, but for paint removal, it could be larger. As you saw in the, in the previous video, there uh, was a, about seven centimeter line uh, for the laser laser cleaner. So you don't need it to be a spot. Depends on what you're cleaning. In case of historical uh, monuments, there may be need for a very small round beam. But if you're just removing a coating from a surface, it could be seven centimeter uh, line. So there's no problem. And then you have a repetition rate. 
a higher repetition rate will increase the depth of ablation. So if you have, let's say, a three millimeter coating uh, and um, you want to basically remove it in one pass, uh, you may want to increase the repetition rate. What are uh, some other uh, important parameters for laser cleaning? I've been doing some uh, literature survey uh, to see what other researchers have done in the field. And I found uh, a number of papers that were talking about um, basically removal of rust or a coating from surfaces that have steel substrates. And uh, it turned out that these researchers found the scan speed a uh, number of passes uh, are two very important parameters that um, control the, basically the depth of ablation and the morphology of the surface after. Uh, so it turned out for scan speed, the depth of removal decreases with an increase in scan speed. So how quickly that scanner is moving, the scanning mirror is moving, uh, it depends uh, it will uh, affect the, the removal, the depth of removal. Here is a, a graph by one of the researchers, depth of crater versus scan speed. And you can see at higher scan speed, around 800 millimeter per second, 600 millimeter per second, the, the depth of crater basically would, would decrease. Initially is higher and then eventually it decreases. Now, another concern for some of the or oh, number of passes also, forgot to mention, increasing number of passes increases ablation rate. So if you couldn't uh, clean the surface in one pass, you may want to increase it to few passes. Uh, so one concern that some of the researchers have for steel substrates, and again, this is the work uh, was done by, by, by a few researchers and I've mentioned their name here, uh, is that uh, you don't want to melt the steel substrate once you, you clean it. So uh, in the one paper, they found out that uh, above a certain fluence, which is energy per centimeter square, there is no melting and the temperature basically returns to uh, normal. It increases uh, to about 1500, 1700 Kelvin, and then it returns to normal very rapidly. Uh, or room temperature rather very rapidly. There's no melting, but above a certain affluence, the, the steel starts to melt and temperature rises very rapidly to more than 3000 Kelvin. And then it takes longer for it to come back to, to normal. So if you're concerned about damaging the substrate, um, you have to be careful about the fluence or, or amount of energy per centimeter square that you put into your beam. So the reference is given here. If you like, you could read this paper. Let's compare with other methods of cleaning the surfaces. The traditional methods of cleaning the surface, uh, uh, surfaces, uh, starting from the left, there's the mechanical brush, uh, rotating brush that basically uh, cleans the surface. Then you have the chemical methods where you apply some kind of chemical, you wait till does certain reactions and then you peel off uh, the, the, the coating just like shown in here. And then there are other methods that all use blasting. So there's dry ice blasting, sand blasting and water blasting shown in here. And all of these methods, basically some material uh, comes out of a nozzle at, uh, at high pressure. Uh, the operator has to be properly dressed and protected against this uh, otherwise, they could be damaging their their eyes or face. Uh, so you can see all these are all these workers. They have their proper address for working there. So what are the disadvantages of these methods? Uh, the main disadvantage is the contamination of the environment. Uh, basically, you have to deal with the secondary waste that all these methods generate after you apply the cleaning. So, and it is expensive. It's not only bad for the environment, it's also expensive to, to do this uh, cleaning after, which could uh, contaminate power supply as uh, water supplies, sorry, water supplies or 
uh, generally the environment. Uh, also, uh, some of these methods like abrasives, uh, mechanical brush, they could potentially damage uh, the, the surface you're working on. So I'll show you an example in later on where a researcher worked on this, uh, compared several different methods. Uh, so they are also pretty noisy. Uh, these uh, sandblasting, for example, generates something like 110 to 120 dB of noise, which is as loud as a siren. Whereas laser cleaning uh, noise is about 76 dB, which is the same sound level as if you are in a crowded restaurant. So this is some uh, pros and cons for each method. So let's look at the advantages of laser cleaning once again. It's non-contact, so no uh, uh, solid piece basically is used. There's only light that is hitting the surface, low environmental impact. You saw that the, that suction pumps removes all the ablated materials. Uh, selectivity, uh, certain parameters such as pulse width, wavelength, and rep rate can be tuned to suit some material better. And I will show you a video of this selectivity uh, later on where you can see from a piece of, uh, uh, basically from a pop can, uh, only red color is being removed and black color is not being removed. So you could be highly selective when you use the, the laser, uh, laser cleaning method. Localized action, once, in, once you use, for example, the chemical method, the, the cleaning could affect other areas, but in case of laser, you only clean the areas where the light is touching uh, that particular area. Preservation of surface details, you can adjust the beam shape so you don't have to damage uh, other things. Uh, and controlled removal, only a certain control thickness can be removed depending on pulse energy, rep rate, pulse width. So let's uh, look at uh, videos, three videos that compare sandblasting, water jet blasting, and laser cleaning. This is from a surface of uh, a ship where they're cleaning basically paint. They're trying to remove the paint to put another layer of paint. So let's see how each one of them work. Here's sandblasting. Let's look at it. So you can see here what level of noise and all the all the contamination is spreading into the environment as well. So this is a sandblasting method. And uh, next one, we go into sorry. Uh, yes, we go into water jetting. So high pressure water comes out of this nozzle and cleans the cleans this piece of metal. Again, all the contamination, the contaminated water, which could potentially have lead in it, uh, you know, just goes and contaminates the surface. Here's a pipe, a rusty pipe is being cleaned. Uh, so one has to deal with the secondary waste there. And the next one would be laser cleaning. You can see that it's faster. And this operator is using this laser cleaner. There are two pipes in here. One is a thicker pipe that is responsible for removing all the uh, ejected material, so it keeps the environment clean as removing the paint very fast and very clean. This thicker pipe is, is basically the suction pump that removes all the abrasion. Okay, so these are the comparison of diff different uh, method. So let's now look at the physics of uh, uh, how it works. Dependence of laser ablation on material properties and laser parameters. So what are the important 
parameters uh, for material is optical attenuation coefficient alpha of the of the material it's in unit of meter inverse the thermal diffusivity dt in millimeter square per second basically how quickly the uh, the heat could diffuse into the material uh, density rho heat of vaporization hv in joules per gram so how much is required to remove a particular material per unit weight uh, how much energy is required to remove a particular material per unit weight so that's heat of vaporization hv and for lasers type of laser the pulse width fluence which is energy per centimeter square and beam size so if you look at the picture on the right side it shows a pulse laser beam shown in orange uh, that is uh, hitting this block of material. And when the pulse width is less than 10 picosecond, the short pulse width, uh, the optical penetration depth, which is this orange part that I'm showing with the mouse, and the thermal penetration depths are the same. And they're given by inverse of 1 over absorption coefficient or L alpha. So that's the heat penetrates as much as the light penetrates into the material. But uh, when the pulses increase to greater than 10 picosecond, uh, you can see something else happens. So although the beam of light only penetrates up to L alpha, there is more thermal diffusion into the material. So the, the, the the heat penetrates into the material up to the depth LT, which is bigger than L alpha. And LT actually is a function of the thermal diffusivity and the pulse width. So a square root of DT to tau L. So the longer the pulse width, uh, the bigger would be the, the, the penetration depth LT. Uh, so for picosecond, nanosecond pulses, thermal penetration depth is greater and optical penetration depth and grows with pulse duration. So that would have an impact on the threshold fluence that you need to apply to remove that, that material. So to achieve ablation, enough energy has to be deposited per unit area to evaporate the material. And this is the fluence or energy per unit area, which is called the threshold fluence. So how would it vary between uh, uh, femtosecond regime or uh, picosecond nanosecond in case of pulses less than pico, picosecond 10 picosecond the threshold fluence is basically independent of the pulse width it's a uh, product of density heat of vaporization and pen optical penetration depths but for pulses that are bigger than 10 picosecond there will become a dependence on, on the uh, thermal penetration depths, LT, which is in turn a function of pulse width. So the longer the pulse width, the larger would be the threshold, the uh, threshold fluence. So you'd need to apply more energy to remove, remove the material. So that's the difference between the picosecond and femtosecond or picosecond nanosecond and femtosecond regime so let's go back to uh, ablation again uh, for a minute uh, so and examine femtosecond picosecond nanosecond regime behavior uh, so in case of Thai sapphire laser which we talked about before the near IR laser it has femtosecond pulses very short pulses uh, these sh very short pulses are are best for uh, basically laser machining uh, because when you have short pulses, you don't have melting. So there's no liquid phase physics involved. So here on the right side picture, you can see there's a femtosecond pulse is irradiating the surface and there is no plasma plume. There is no damage caused to adjacent structures. There's no heat transfer to surrounding material. Uh, no shock wave, no micro cracks. Uh, so it's a very clean uh, operation. What, when you're using picosecond, nanosecond pulses, uh, you 
will introduce some uh, liquid physics. There will be shock wave, there will be heat affected zone, melt zone, micro cracks, um, recast layer, surface debris, uh, damage caused by adjacent, adjacent structures. So these will all come into picture, which may not matter if you're just cleaning a surface, but for a case of micro machining, it may be better to use the shorter pulses. Here's an example where a particular hole was uh, made using three lasers of different regimes. So for 200 femtosecond uh, laser, the, the hole is very clean cut and there is no debris, there is no melting. When you go to the 80 picosecond, you see there is some uh, debris around the hole, some melting. And when you have a 3.3 nanosecond pulse, you have a lot of uh, evaporation, or sorry, a lot of melting, a lot of debris around the hole. So this is where a proper understanding of what you want to do with the laser for which particular material comes into importance to understand that you would introduce heating effects when you're using longer pulses. So these are some uh, interesting plots that apply to laser cleaning and we go back to the laser cleaning. Uh, so uh, I would just like to discuss these. So metal has a very small absorption at 10 micron. Plastic ceramic glass is a very high absorption at 10 micron. So if you want to, for example, clean uh, paint from a, from a surface that has aluminum underneath, uh, it is less risky to use a CO2 laser because the paint absorbs the 10 micron very effectively and the aluminum underneath reflects it. So this way you're sure you're not damaging the substrate. Uh, here you can see if you look at the absorption, the ceramic and glass they have such high absorption at around 10 micron. But uh, when you look at the metal, metal has lower absorption at 10 micron. So in some ways, using CO2 lasers is better as compared to uh, 1064 nanometer laser. But uh, the problem with CO2 laser is that uh, you can't use fiber optics. Fiber optics is, is very well uh, established for the near infrared, but it's not really that much available for CO2. So directing the beam is much more difficult using CO2. And besides, uh, if you control the parameters properly with a near infrared laser, you can still uh, remove the, the paint or the coating very effectively without damaging the substrate. So uh, you can also use UV lasers in this area uh, it's for nuclear decontamination. Uh, Neodymium YAG laser at one micron. You can just see that although the ceramic and glass of low absorption uh, is comparable to the metal. And for directing the beam, uh, Usually these lasers have galvos or other types of scanners. We'll talk about the other type of scanner as well, the polygon scanner, but these galvo mirrors would direct the beam uh, to where it needs to be cleaned. You can see the steel surface, uh, the steel surface parameter here, the curve uh, that in steel has very high absorption at one micron. Uh, so if you not concerned, if you're not concerned about uh, damaging the steel, then you can use one micron, uh, but you can still clean it. You can still clean rust with a steel substrate if you control the parameters properly. I'll get to that later a little bit. So these graphs are quite important when you're dealing with laser cleaning. One has to refer to them to see what are the absorption of the coating and what is the absorption of the substrate. So uh, how to properly choose each one. Then uh, you also have the servo and polygon scanners. This servo scanners already used usually have two uh, mirrors. Uh, they're rotating mirrors 
X axis and one Y axis. And then you have a polygon scanner shown in here that has many facets here. So why um, uh, um, the difference between the two? Why do you need to use a different type of scanner? It's because the servo type scanners cannot handle very high powers, whereas the polygon scanners can. Uh, so if you use very high power laser with a servo scanner, you may damage the mirrors. So advantage of polygon scanner or servo scanner uh, has faster scanning speed compared to Galvo scanner, I mean like 50 meters per second as compared to 10 meters per second. Uh, polygon scanners are lighter in weight. So if you want to use uh, servo with high power, you need to have a very heavy mirror, which is not possible. The stripping efficiency, uh, which is defined as paint volume removed per energy input is two to three times better as compared to Galvo scanner. Uh, polygon scanners can tolerate higher laser powers up to 10 to 15 kilowatts. And combination of CW lasers that are sometimes more available, more robust, and more powerful with the Galvo scanner, with the sorry, polygon scanner worked really well. And uh, uh, you can also remove the affluence much easier. So these are some of the applications. Uh, so what about laser cleaning? Applications of laser cleaning. Uh, so cleaning of historical monuments where you have layers of nitrates and sulfate accumulated on them, uh, cleaning oxide coatings in semiconductor industry, paint removal in aviation industry, removal of rust, which is basically iron oxide from pipes, varnished wood, sandstone, decorative steel. And uh, I have done some research on uh, removing rust from historical monuments uh, some literature survey and some very interesting results. Uh, what laser works best uh, for removing rust from a surface? I'll show you those results later. Decontamination of nuclear power plant, lead paint removal. So, and here are some of the lasers uh, that are shown what, what, what contaminants they can remove. So there's a research uh, paper or also there's a thesis, it's a collection of research papers by this uh, author, Yang Suko, that uh, I was reading and it has compared eight different methods, three of them being mechanical methods and five of them being a uh, laser-based method to clean basically uh, rust from a pattern steel substrate. So this is steel substrate has these uh, this pattern it's about uh, uh, different groove heights, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 2 millimeters. And uh, they were, um, several identical pieces were made and they were put in a rusting chamber and they were uh, rusted to a certain degree. And then all these methods were applied on removing the rust and compared with each other to see which one works better. So microblasting with glass, microblasting with aluminum, and rotating steel brush. So microblasting has the uh, advantage that there's this mechanical transfer of momentum from the, uh, the solid pieces to that uh, coating material that has to be removed. That turns out to be quite important. Uh, rotating steel brush, we'll, we'll see how it works uh, on this cleaning of this. And then they use the CO2 laser, 10.6 micron and YAG lasers, 1.06 with a dry surface or pouring water during the operation. And then also the double um, harmonic at 532. So after doing the cleaning, they found that uh, the best method was the microblasting. Of course, not considering the contamination it causes uh, that has to be cleaned, but it cleaned it the best and the second best method was the neodymium yak on a wet surface. And the wet method worked better than the dry method because there is vaporization of water and uh, expansion and partial vaporization of water helped the cleaning method. Mechanical brushing 
cause damage to this uh, jagged uh, structure, and CO2 laser was less effective than near IR in removing rust. So I'm just going to move quickly on the rest some of these uh, um, remaining slides. Uh, use of laser cleaning in case of historical monuments. Here you see the obelisk of Pharaoh in, in Egypt. That was uh, contaminated with nitrate and sulfate, uh, basically layers, and was cleaned with laser cleaner. In the case of historical monuments, you can see one side has been cleaned, the other hasn't and how delicate this surface is, you need to have a really small laser beam to move around and clean uh, so that you don't damage uh, and basically take care of the contamination in each uh, nooks and uh, areas in here. And here is a marble cleaning and you can see one side has been cleaned, the other is still not clean. So these are all the applications. Uh, in case of uh, acid erosion, laser cleaning can obviously do nothing. Here is a statue that has been affected by acid erosion it's because acid eats into the material, so there's nothing could be done about it. But uh, laser cleaning is quite effective in cleaning the historical monuments. Now, here's another very interesting application, laser cleaning of aircraft parts. So. Aircrafts usually uh, have to be um, uh, cleaned. Basically, the older paint has to be removed and uh, the newer paint has to be placed after a few years. Uh, so the question is why you have to remove the old, older paint? Why can't you just paint on top of that? Uh, simply because it will add weight to the, to the aircraft. So it is important for, for the aircraft to get rid of the older paint and put the newer paint. And at the same time, you don't want to damage the, the metal substrate because uh, it's quite important for aircraft to have a solid structure. So that's why CO2 lasers um, are, are very safe to use with aircraft, but you can also use uh, well-controlled neodymium YAG lasers uh, that have uh, fiber optic delivery and proper parameter control to clean. So they're, they're fine as well. So here you can see in the case of CO2 lasers, you have all these robots that are moving around and they're, they're, they are cleaning. Whereas you have, if you had a neodymium YAG laser, you could have cleaned the areas with the CO2. Sorry, you could have cleaned the area with the with the fiber optics, sorry. You could have cleaned the area with the fiber optics, so it's much easier to, to work with. Here is another uh, application, laser cleaning of for nuclear decontamination. Uh, here in Ontario, we generate 60% of our electricity uh, using, uh, basically we use uh, nuclear power plants to generate electricity uh, we don't use any coal at all in Ontario. So yeah, it is quite important to, uh, to, to get rid of these nuclear power plants after a few years for safety reasons. Uh, so you need to decommission these nuclear power plants. And here is one example where workers are decommissioning a nuclear power plant. And one has to get rid of all the concrete blocks and also the metal pieces that are inside, they're contaminated with radioactivity, so they need to be cleaned and they could be recycled. They could be used in another nuclear power plants, but the concrete blocks, they cannot be uh, thrown away just as is. They have to be cleaned and then thrown away. Uh, normally, uh, every 30 to 40 years, you have to clean these uh, or this decommission these nuclear power plants and they have all these deposits of cobalt 60 with a seven year half life on it. So for this reason, we get to our case study number one. We were testing at Permafix nuclear decontamination facility in Northland, uh, Northwest is in Richmond, Washington. And they deal with 
uh, low and intermediate level contamination, radioactive contamination. So in the testing permafixed nuclear decontamination facility, we use our laser blast 100 watt system and uh, several uh, metal pieces, there's concrete pieces and several metal pieces that were used in a nuclear power plant was brought up there and it was in an isolated room uh, basically with all the workers uh, having the, the, the work attire uh, working on it and trying to clean it. So they would make a reference measurement at the beginning and measure the amount of radioactivity. Then they clean the surface and then they remeasure. And then after a certain level, they would see that it's gone below the uh, basically dangerous level or is in the safe, safe, safe level. So here, for example, you can see it took four trials uh, to bring down the level of radioactivity from 4,000 disintegration per minute to 1,000 in case of the concrete block. And in case of metal jackhammer, it took only two trials to bring it below 1,000 and so on. So let's look at this video and get a better, better understanding of how this happened. This was done in July 17, 2018. Use the 100 watt laser blast system. So here is the metal steel plate that is being cleaned. This uh, black tube here is the suction pump that takes the contaminants to a, a filter on the other side. So the radiation technologist is measuring the amount of uh, uh, contamination from the surface several times. Our engineer is outside uh, this clean room and is giving directions to, 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 the, to the worker here to adjust the laser parameters. Here you could see the laser, the, the optical lens of the laser. In this case, you're seeing a C clamp being cleaned. After two passes, the contamination went below 1,000. C clamp again. Before the laser, it was 10,000 dpm. After the laser, it was reduced to 1,000 dpm, which is in the safe level. Cutting torch. Yeah, how it's yeah, like that. So uh, basically, uh, I'm just going to uh, move on uh, because I want to show the other videos. Uh, there's the testing at Canadian Aviation Museum in Ottawa, Ontario, where you can see there's these engine parts of, uh, of aircrafts that are contaminated with soot and, and grease and oil, and they're being cleaned. So here is an example. So you want even out to try to get the problem. Yeah, so when you go to the stubborn area too, sometimes you know, Sometimes you, you, you want to create a terminal effect, so you want that to be out of focus, or you actually create a bit of heat, and then you go uh, on focus, and then you So this was one, and then we're going to this one. The oil 
and grease are being removed. So right now you'd be burning carbon, lead, all right, moving on. Uh, sorry, this is not the one. Uh, just moving on to the next slide. Sorry. Uh, here is the leaded paint laser cleaning. So for lead, you have to be very careful because uh, the room has to be equipped with proper uh, filters and uh, suction pumps to remove all the particulate uh, lead because you can't uh, basically breathe that air which is contaminated with lead. So here is an example of removing leaded paint. This was done at our headquarters. Okay, and then uh, uh, in case of study number four, we used the polygon scanner in, uh, and generated all these lines, uh, try to remove paint from a metal surface. So here's a polygon scanner. You can see the rotating piece here is the polygon scanner and it's generating all these lines, which uh, makes it more effective because the several lines are, are used at the same time and they remove the paint. This was uh, mounted on an XY stage, so it is moving. Okay, and uh, here is another interesting example. Uh, removal of paint from inside a pipe using a circular laser beam. Several uh, customers have contacted us and asked us how is it possible to clean a rust from inside a pipe. So for this reason, we show this video uh, where we generated a circular beam. And uh, you can see a circular beam has been generated and is cleaning inside the pipe. So the pipe has been mounted on an XY stage is moving back and forth. And the inside of the pipe is cleaned of rust. You can also mount this uh, laser cleaner on a robot and go inside a pump, if uh, inside a pipe, if, if necessary. That's also a possibility. Okay, now uh, I was talking about uh, selectivity of laser cleaning and this video over here of the Coke Zero can shows the selectivity very well. So you can uh, see it very clearly how this is done. So here Coke Zero can is being illuminated. And you can see that only the black color is being removed and red color and white color they remained uh, intact. So that's how selective you can be in removing this. So absorption coefficient of the black color is more, so it requires less energy to be removed compared to red and, and white. But the question is, can you remove red and not remove the black? And the answer is no, because once you increase the energy level to be able to remove red, you will also remove the black, but you could remove black without removing red. So this is quite an interesting example of selectivity. So moving on fast to two other applications. Uh, uh, one application is laser cleaning of composite surfaces and several customers uh, are interested in using uh, cleaning customer, the composite surfaces, the carbon fiber reinforced polymer CFRP they're very popular these days due to their lightweight and material strength. And we have done some testing in the area and actually turns out that our nanosecond lasers are not suitable to clean these. Uh, basically, they will destroy the material. Uh, the best lasers to clean the uh, composite surfaces would be either uh, 
a UV laser beam, or it could be a femtosecond near IR fiber laser, or so two choices, UV excimer lasers, uh, they could make it clean, uh, make the process very clean without damaging, or a femtosecond. In case of nanosecond lasers, there will be melting and micro cracks and the fibers will be damaged. And we verified that with uh, our testing, basically. Uh, and then there are these two applications of laser cleaning of greasy and bacteria infected surfaces. Uh, so this could be used in the food industry. And um, there are some research papers here that looked at different types of lasers in cleaning bacterial surfaces. Uh, fortunately, we don't have time to go through this, but for the food industry, you can remove grease and, and oil from the trays uh, that are used in barbecuing and, and cooking. And we can also use them to remove bacteria. So in conclusions, uh, laser cleaning through the process of laser ablation is more efficient, faster, less noisy, more economical as compared to other paint removal methods such as sandblasting, dry icing, and chemical stripping. Uh, and um, use of near IR laser with fiber optics makes the paint stripping or contaminant removal very flexible to clean hard to reach places. Industrial fiber lasers are rapidly growing in manufacturing and Laser pulse width, fluence, rep rate, wavelength are important parameters that need to be considered for different applications. Material surface properties need to be considered as well. Uh, polygon scanners are more robust, faster, lighter in weight, and can tolerate higher laser powers up to 10 to 15 kilowatts as compared to Galwell scanners. Combination of polygon scanners and high power CW lasers can compete with high energy pulse laser Galvel scanner combination. And finally, although CO2 laser wavelength is better absorbed by polymers such as paint and reflected by metals, for paint stripping or metal surfaces near IR lasers can also be used uh, because of use of fiber optics and ability to adjust the laser power to below the damage threshold of metal. So with this uh, slide, we come to the end of our presentation and thank you for listening. Are there any questions?